Can we just rise up and share a word of um, prayer? Father Lord, we thank you for a day like this. We thank you for being with us throughout the whole night, even waking us up this morning, uh, bringing us to church today. Father, let the words that come out of my mouth, let it not be from me, but let it be from you. And Father Lord, what comes out of my mouth today, the word from you, let it minister unto all those listening today and bless their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Can we have a seat? Once again, I would like to thank Pastor for giving me this opportunity again to share the word of God. I always feel blessed and very special to have. It's a special privilege, you know, when you have the chance to share the word of God with the people of, of God. Uh, the title of the message today is Confronting the Spirit of Containment. Confronting the Spirit of Containment. We have in our text from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 to 31. So I, I, I'll need a very fast reader. Somebody that can read very fast. If okay, 2 Kings chapter 6, 8 to 31. And the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. Thank you very much for reading um, all those verses, Pastor. I just wanted us to have an understanding of the um, sermon for today, confronting the spirit of containment. Now, you, you will notice from the passage that we read that ben Haddad, the king of Syria, had tried so many things, he had tried so many ways to attack Israel. There is nothing he hadn't tried. He attacked them from the right, attacked them from the left, attacked them from the center. He had tried all the strategies that he could think of, but somehow, for some reason, he was always failing. At every point in time, something was always going wrong. And from the verse that we read just now, you will find that one of his men said that there is somebody in the camp of Israel that is always telling the king what you said in, in your bedroom. You know, and he tried, he, I mean, he, he had tried everything possible. At the end of the day, he said, okay, go and bring me that person. He sent his army, go and bring me that person. And at the end of the day, if you read the whole story, you, you will find out that his army were caught, were given to the king of Israel. The king of Israel said, should I kill them? Should I destroy them? At the end of the day, they were embarrassed because if you go to fight people, and you were caught and you were given food to eat and sent home back to your, your king. That is a form of embarrassment. Serious embarrassment. You wouldn't want to come again to that kind of place. But he tried everything possible. And at the end of the day, he didn't give up. The Bible says he didn't give up. Even though chapter 31 said they never came back, but they did come back. So the king ben had said, okay, I've tried everything. There is nothing I haven't done. So he came up with a new strategy, something that he hadn't used before. If we read down, I'll just read it real quick. If we read from verse um, 24, you see, it says, And it happened after this that ben Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. He gathered up all his army and went up and besieged. I look up at my dictionary, the meaning of a siege, to besiege. And this is what I saw in the dictionary. It said, a siege is an operation of encampment where the enemy is surrounded and the supply and communication is cut off. So the Bible says that the king had tried to attack, use different strategies, but he, he, he did so. Every time he was always failing. So this time, he besieged them. He didn't go to attack them this time. He just surrounded them. He says, okay, I'm not going to attack them this time. I've tried to attack. I've tried to use bows and arrows. I've tried to come with chariots and horses. But for some reason, I always fail. So this time, I'll just surround them. I'll besiege them. And the Bible says that there was a famine 
after some time, there was a famine. The people in Samaria just noticed that they saw soldiers around, but those soldiers were not attacking them. There was no arrow shot, no guns were shot, no bullets were shot. So everything seemed very normal to them. Nothing was going on. So they felt relaxed. They were very happy. They just said, oh, okay, maybe they're just setting camp, setting tent. But as long as they're not attacking us, we're very happy. We feel very happy and we feel very comfortable. This was a new strategy that the king used. So many times in our lives, the devil tries to attack us. See, when you're a child of God, when you've given your life to Christ, when you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the angels of God form the camp around you. The angels of God are just around you that the devil cannot attack you. He can't touch you. There's nothing he can do to you. So what happens? The devil uses a new technique and he calls it a siege. The devil tries to contain you. The devil doesn't attack you, but the devil spares your health, spares your life, spares your family. But the devil forms a siege. He tries to contain you. Now the question is, how does the devil contain you? What does he do? The devil makes you stop praying. You just, for some reason, you get so busy with work, so busy with what you're doing that you forget to pray. Sometimes you forget to pray in the morning. You are so busy that you leave the house, you forget to pray. You normally pray in the mornings with your wife, but you forget to pray. Even before you sleep, you're so tired from work, you're back home, you're so tired. Okay, I will sleep tomorrow, or I'll pray tomorrow. You, you forget to pray. Sometimes, he connects you to a bad relationship. We've heard of men of God that were doing exploits. They did so many things, but somehow they had a relationship with an unholy or ungodly woman. And then all of a sudden, something happens to their ministry. You see, the devil didn't touch them. He didn't attack them physically. He didn't touch their health. He didn't touch their business. But he contained them. He connected them to a bad relationship. Sometimes the devil can connect you to a bad business deal. Everything has been going on fine so far in your life. Nothing has happened. But the devil forms a siege and connects you to a bad business deal. And at the end of the day, what happens? Your ministry starts going down. Your business, everything just starts going down. Sometimes we see some people, they actually come to church but not to fellowship. There's a difference between coming to church and coming to fellowship. You hear a lot of people, they say, look, I'm coming to church. When the pastor says, praise the Lord, I say, amen. No wahala. I don't want anybody's wahala. I just come for Pastor Abel. I come to praise the Lord and go. They don't fellowship with people. They just come to church. Amen. Enter their car. Go home. No fellowship. You see, containment or siege is not an event. It is a process. An event is something that, I'll give you an example of an, an event. An event is like an accident. Or when you have an accident, it gets bad. Then after some time, it starts getting better. Because if you have an accident, your car has an accident, you know that the car has been destroyed, you go to the mechanic, you fix it, then your car starts getting better. But for a process, it looks as if everything is okay. Everything is going on fine. Nothing is going wrong. Everything is okay. Then all of a sudden, it starts becoming bad. An event is something that is bad at the beginning, then it gets better. But for a process, it's good at the beginning, then it gets worse. Sometimes you can't explain a siege. It's difficult to explain a stage. It's difficult to ex explain containment because it looks as if everything is okay. Nothing is wrong. Because everything seems to be okay. Everything is okay. Your business is okay. Your children are, are okay. Everybody's healthy. Nothing is going on fine. But the devil is forming a siege. He's encamping you. And at the end of the day, a famine will take place. The strategy of the devil is to form a siege. Is to contain you and then you self-destruct. If you look at what happened in Samaria, there was no war, no arrows of fire, like I said. 
No um, weapons were fired. No spares were thrown. So the people were very happy. They felt very contented. But what happened at the end of the day? What happened? There was a famine. The worst place to be in life is to be in a fight. I don't even know that there's a fight going on. When you are actually involved in a battle, but you can't even see the people that you are fighting against. Nothing is happening. Because you see, when you can see people you are fighting with, if somebody throws you a punch, you will know if you want to dodge or if you want to fight back. But in, in this case, nothing was going on. There was no punch being thrown. There were no arrows being thrown. So the people, the people in Samaria felt very comfortable. They were so happy. And at the end of the day, what happened? There was a famine. It got so bad that the Bible says that people started eating their children. So what exactly happened? How come so, nothing was happening, then all of a sudden there was famine. Because the, the king of Samaria, of Syria, had formed an encampment all around so that there was nothing coming in and nothing going out. But because it was a process, the process is slow, you don't see it immediately. It's like when you're sick, it's like people that have AIDS. You don't see it immediately. You are healthy. In fact, you can even be so fat. And you think you're healthy, but it's a gradual process. Remember, I told you it's not an event. An event happens immediately. You see it immediately, and you know that something happens. It's like when you fall from a tree and you have an injury, you know that there's something wrong somewhere. So you go straight to the hospital. But a process happens gradually. It got so bad that the Bible says that a donkey's head was sold for. 80 shekels of silver. Now, if you put this in context, if you move, if you fast forward to the um, New Testament, if you remember when Jesus was betrayed, do you still remember how much he was betrayed for? Or so for? That was years ahead of this. This was in the New Testament. 30 pieces of silver. 30, and this is 80. For a donkey's head. Not the whole donkey, just the head of the donkey. That means this donkey at this point was worth almost three times, just, just the donkey's head was worth almost three times what the whole of Jesus was worth for then. That is just put in context the gravity of the famine that was happening there. It was terrible. Now, the question for you is my question for you is are you under siege? Have you been contained? Has the devil actually put you under siege? Or do you think everything is going on normal in your life? Because that's what happens to a lot of people. They feel that everything is going on normal. I'm happy. My job is going on fine. I collect my salary every month. You know, I go to church. A lot of people go to church every Sunday. The devil is happy with you going to church. Even if you want to pray, pray as long as you don't move from where you are. You remain in that same position. From January to December, you don't move. You can go to church every Sunday if you want. You can pray if you want. But as long as you don't move from where you are, you're just there until you self-destruct. That is called the spirit of containment. Because if from January to December, and then from January to December of the next year, you are in the same position that you were two or three years ago, then something is wrong. You are definitely under siege. If you haven't moved forward, if you are still in the same position you were two or three years ago, you're definitely being contained. You're definitely under siege. And this is what the devil wants. Now, how do you know if you are under siege? How do you know if you've been contained? The first thing that would happen and you know that you are under siege is that worthless things become valuable. When in your life some worthless things become valuable, very valuable in your life, that's an example of being under siege. I'll give you an example. You wake up in the morning, you don't go to work, 
you sit down in your living room or in your parlor, you pick up the phone, and then you start getting involved in a three hour gossiping conversation. Just gossiping for three hours. Talking and talking and gossiping about different people crossing your leg. You don't have a job. Others are going out looking for a job and just sitting down, discussing with another person that obviously doesn't have a job for three hours on the phone, telling what happened last week in church and how the pastor's face was looking and how the um, sister Bola and how they dressed and you are under siege. You've been contained. If you go to borrow money to buy the latest fashion, you don't have money, there's no money in your account, but you go and borrow money because you want to buy the latest fashion, the latest perfume, the latest um, phone, latest everything. There's a problem somewhere. You are on the siege. You're being contained. The country has made it so easy now. You don't even have to go and borrow money. They just give you a credit card. You have a credit card, so you go and pay for what you want. Now, don't get me wrong. Credit card is not bad. But when you start using credit card for some useless things, you take your credit card, you go to the shop, you know, you just look for one thing that is not relevant at all, swipe, and say yes, remove the money. Remember, it's not your money. When you use a credit card, it's not your money. It's other people's money. When you use a credit card for interesting things or things that will develop your life, like maybe your education or you buy a house or things like that, that is good. But when you start using a credit card for irrelevant things, irrelevant things, things, for example, you, you go and buy one latest, latest designer, some clothes, before you reach the house, the button has gone off, the value has dropped immediately. Before, I, I'm sure you've seen it before, you, you buy a shoe before you reach the house, something is out of the shoe, I have to return the shoe, or I have to return the, you are on the scene. You also under siege when valuable things become worthless in your life. When things that are important, things that should be important, when they become worthless in your life, you are under siege. Let's take an example. Let me, let's read verse 28 of that same chapter. The king asked, the, the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, this woman said to me, give me your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him today. And, and I said unto her, okay, that's fine. Just 28. The king, the, uh, and she answered, this woman said to me, give me your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. When it gets to a, the stage that your own child, your own son. I mean, we are taught to know that um, our children are our future. Children are our future, basically. So when it gets to the stage that you <laughs> you think of eating your own son, I'm even wondering how hungry that lady was. That both of them, how their appetite, that they finished one whole human being in one day. Finish the whole human being that day. So the next day they were so hungry and they were not looking for how they were, to, they were looking forward to eat the next human being the next day. I don't support cannibalism, but you know, I'm just trying to put a sense of humor here that okay, maybe they should have not eaten one part of, of their hand and left. <laughs> that is definitely not for me. But it's just my imagination. When it gets to the level that you eat something that is valuable to you, you start. It, they didn't even go and look for another person to eat. It was their own child that they ate. They ate their future. There are a lot of people that are in this UK. They don't value going to church. They know it's important to go to church. They come from Nigeria. When they were in Nigeria, they were going to church. They were, you know, Holy Ghost fire. They pray with their head and everything. But now they're in the UK. They realize that on Sunday you can get double pay, you can get so much money for working on Sundays. They know that going to church and praising God on a Sunday is valuable to them. But they prefer to work and make money. When it gets to a point in your life that valuable things, what when valuable things like going to church and praising the Lord 
fellowship with God becomes worthless, then you're under siege. You've been contained. The devil has contained you. Even without you knowing. They'll give you different excuses. They'll say, ah, you know, there's so many ways to praise the Lord. You can, you know, internet is there. You know, you can um, listen to music. You can, they'll give you so many ways. They'll tell you so many things. They'll give you a lot of like, excuses for not going to church and fellowship with God and the people of, of God. When it gets to that point, then you're under siege. You're also under siege if you live only for today. Just for today. You don't think of tomorrow. You're living just for today. If somebody can read Genesis 25 verse 32 for me. Thank you very much. So I'm sure we know that story. It's it's also his, his best right. Can you read that again? Sorry, can you go? Can you and Jacob said, "Swear to me this day," and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and potting of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. God, Esau despised his birthright. Esau was hungry. He was just hungry. All he wanted was just some food to eat. He came back and was hungry. And because he was hungry, what happened? The Bible says he sold what? His birthright. Just because of food. He wasn't thinking about tomorrow. He said, oh, I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. So he sold his birthright. When it gets to a point that you're living only for today, you're not thinking about your future. You're not thinking about tomorrow. You're not thinking about what's going to happen in the next five years. You are thinking only about today. If somebody asks you, what is your plan for tomorrow? What is your plan for the next five years? Are you planning your life? I say, look, I just take life as it comes. You are under siege. When you look at the, the women in that story of Samaria, they were not thinking about their future because if they were thinking about their future, they would know that their children are their future. That the kids they have are their future. They prefer to eat one child today than tomorrow. That's the only plan they have for tomorrow, to eat the next child. After that, I wonder what they would have done next. You're also under siege when you are helpless and desperate. When you're helpless and desperate. Let's read verses 27. Can someone read that for me, please? Uh, the same... Uh, Second Kings chapter six verse twenty seven. Verse twenty seven of Second Kings chapter six. And he six. said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the trashy floor or from the white press? Thank you. Thank you. I'll just add 26 to that. Then, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help my lord, O king. Remember, that was the king of Israel. The king is supposed to be a provider. The king should be able to provide anything they want. Food, help, anything. Because he was a king. He was the king of Israel. But he couldn't help at that point. When it gets to a point that nobody can help you again, your problem is so complex, so complicated. It's so bad that people that used to help you before, they cannot help you again. You are on the siege. You are being contained without knowing. You're also under siege when you start looking for a scapegoat. If you read that same chapter, verses 30 to 31, please. 30 to 31, I can read that real quick. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes. And as he passed by the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Then he said, God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his head today. If you read the whole, if you read the whole story, you start, it's Elisha that has been helping out throughout. Anytime the king of Syria wanted to attack, it was always Elisha, every time. So, it's interesting that at this point, 
He was trying to blame Elisha. When it gets to a point that you have a problem and you always have somebody to blame, there is always somebody to blame for your problem. Even invisible people you don't see, there is always somebody to blame every time. Even for little things. Then you are under siege. I told you earlier that a siege is not an event. It's a process. It happens gradually. You will feel that everything is normal in your life. Nothing has changed. You are praying. You are going to church. You might even be going to church. Your job is spared. Everything is okay. Your health is spared. Nothing is happen happening. But the devil has formed an encampment. He has surrounded you. He has besieged you. There is no communication. He has cut off your supply. And gradually, gradually, what happens? At the end of the day, there will be a famine. You will self-destruct. When everything seems to be okay in your family, your family is okay. But you notice that there's always argument. There's always quarrel. You guys are always fighting every time. And that fight one day might lead to self-destruction. The devil didn't come just to somewhere and surrounded you. And at the end of the day, things happen. It besieged you. And at the end of the day, you get self-destroyed. No one touched you. No one came physically. But you were encamped. You were surrounded. Supply was cut off. You were under siege. And that's exactly what happened to the people in Samaria. So if you're under siege, if you think back carefully and you believe that somehow you've been under siege in one way or the other, you have to ask God to come and help you. You have to ask God to come into your life. You need to pray and ask God to come and help you out. I will end by saying it is the devil's responsibility to create a siege. It's your responsibility to identify that siege. And it's God's responsibility to break the siege. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The question is that are you under a siege? Are you sure you are not? Edged around, surrounded by the devil. I want you to talk to God this hour. Those who are hearing the sound, who are listening this moment, talk to God. You used to be a Christian, but now you are not. Or you used to be a Christian, but along the line, you still claim to be Christian, but you don't do what Christians, what true Christians are supposed to do. You're under a siege. You don't know what you are doing. You're under a siege. Ask the Lord to set you free right now. Ask the Lord to set you free. And I'm telling you, you'll be set free. The living God himself will set you free no matter what. Talk to him. And if you have not surrendered unto Him, if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, you are under a terrible sage. And if you continue in that sage, the devil will be very happy to lead you on to the lake of fire. For the Lord doesn't want you to be there. So the siege of sin, the siege that the devil has placed you permanently, you need Jesus to bring it up. Call upon the Lord Jesus to come into your life and set you free. If Jesus sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Father, we thank you for your song you have used today. We appreciate you, God, for your word that has come unto us. Our Father and our Lord, we ask that God indeed you will replenish him. You will refill him. And as many who have heard their word, Lord, you will change and transform their lives. That their lives will not remain the same again. In the name of Jesus Christ. As many, oh Lord, who are making decision right now. I say, oh, I don't know I was in a siege. I don't know the devil surrounded me. It is really a process that has been taking place. 
But now realize that Lord Jesus, as they call upon you this moment, Lord, rescue them. Every sea surrounding your life, right now in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit will come down. The fire of God will descend and break the siege of you, and you'll be set free, and you'll be in fellowship with God through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, because God, when you set us free, we are free indeed. Blessed be your name, O God. In the name of Jesus, we pray.